I'm Natalie Van Have. I'm the head of uh, education at the European Hematology Association. And I'm Martin Kaiser. I'm a consultant hematologist and also a translational researcher at the Royal Marsden Hospital in London and the ICR in London as well. Well, nice to be speaking with you, Martin. Um, we're here to talk about HTA, which is Health Technology Assessment. So uh, maybe we should start with a definition. How would you define HTA? Yes, I think we're uh, all uh, not maybe many are not that familiar with the topic yet uh, it's uh, effectively a tool to assess what additional value or uh, improvement uh, new technology and technology is a wide term here it was chosen to cover both drugs but potentially also devices or interventions of any other type uh, what benefit they bring to the current standard of care so we're, very, we're all very used to hearing about, for example, that the drug undergoes evaluation by a regulator, uh, such as the FDA or the EMA, but their scope is actually probably more limited than many people think. What they are really evaluating is a very defined question. A, 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 uh, mostly it is an industry. Drug manufacturer has, for example, designed a trial, uh, but that trial has very, very defined uh, limits and it more or less is often defined to show that something isn't more toxic than what is the comparator arm and hopefully is more efficacious than the comparator arm. But health technology assessment goes wider. It looks at what is actually being used as a standard of care in a healthcare system. It's broadly a technology, it's broadly a tool that's being used by public healthcare systems um, to actually allow only technologies into practice that are really an improvement to current standard of care. Okay. And and how uh, is this particularly relevant to hematology? I think it is because um, we are, of course, in hematology, at least in, in many of our um, diseases that we're treating, especially in the on oncological side, but more recently, uh, particularly also on the, on the uh, non-malignant hematology side, seeing uh, very uh, huge improvements with new treatments, mostly systemic treatments, but also very innovative treatments, uh, gene therapies, cellular therapies, but they all um, are ultimately, of course, commercially developed and they all have a price. So the question that comes then in a public healthcare system is what does the public healthcare system spend its resources on? Uh, and it's, of course, very quickly a very emotional and often a very uh, political topic as well. But ultimately, I think it is in our, all of our interests. It is something about fairness. The question is if we, we're, we can be very quickly getting fixated on certain numbers. It's probably not so much about the numbers. It's about the priorities that you set. You know, is, is an intervention for um, a certain life-sustaining measure as ECMO for a child, for example, is, is that in terms of its value, you know, where has that to be compared with another uh, technology that maybe extends life only very marginally for a mostly elderly population? And w w what can a public healthcare system afford within the limits that it naturally has? Mm -hmm. I think it comes with the, uh, with the absolute upside that many societies see in having a general healthcare coverage so that everyone can access the same healthcare. In systems that don't have that, they normally don't have health technology assessment because there it's a commercial question. Mm -hmm. If you have a, pub, a private healthcare system, then of course it will be down to the uh, individual insurer or the individual uh, payer mm -hmm. uh, as to what is paid. Okay. However, there might be a joint thinking over time because also with these very expensive new technologies, even the private insurers sometimes now come to their limits. So it's it's uh, it's very topical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so clearly it's very relevant to uh, researchers, it's very relevant to regulators, it's relevant to pharmaceutical companies. Is it important for the general hematologist? Should general hematologists uh, make the effort to learn a bit about HTA? I think it's, it's, uh, it is useful, yes. And I think it's useful maybe not to think that anyone has to learn um, the, the, the details or the health economical uh, models necessarily behind it. Because what many HTA uh, systems actually really um, evaluate is whether there is good evidence in the first place. So I think what is important for us all to realize when we 
For example, here, if a new treatment is or is not approved for a, a not well, approval is actually a different thing. Approval is what the what the regulator does. But if 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 I cannot access a certain drug in my healthcare system, there can of course be various reasons for that. But one of the questions that we should ask ourselves as well is, has the right evidence be generated? Has it really been compared and really been shown to be better than what I'm using at the moment? And I think this is a little bit where we are all, uh, you know, of course, whether we individually like it or not, we are working in Europe, at least, in public healthcare systems. So it is about this resource use mm -hmm. and about really thinking harder about whether anything that is a new technology really will bring an improvement for our patients and whether um, that that is it has been shown very yeah. clearly yeah. and reflecting on that. Yeah. Well, you, you just mentioned quite rightly, of course, we're in Europe and we're the European Hematology Association. Now, how does HTA work in Europe, given that we are made of many countries? Is there a standardized process where it's done the same way everywhere or, or not? And and what are the consequences? Yes, this, so this is where the big change is coming. So there hasn't been a joint process so far. It was even going so far that some countries um, had a certain ag arrangement by which uh, the regulator's approval, the EMA's approval, more or less immediately led to the drug being reimbursed, whereas for other countries it looked like as if there was a magical barrier for them never to get access to a treatment. But this will change. So from with new legislation that has just been passed by the European Parliament, there will be a joint process by which every drug that is going to the European regulator also will have to undergo the HTA process in parallel. It will still mean that there is a big diversity between different countries because ultimately which drug is reimbursed is the budgetary responsibility of every single uh, uh, country in, a, in, in, in within its budget. So no one can make a, a central decision. But I think what the benefits could be, and I think we all have to brace ourselves, there will be have to be a learning process. When this starts, it will be a new thing. But there could be a potential benefit in that there will be higher requirements for evidence to be generated. Uh, and and um, I think this could be an opportunity for us all to reflect on what evidence should really be generated. Mm -hmm. Because by the same token, I think we have a very, very strong research um, network in, the, in, in European countries. A lot of the data that's been generated in trials is generated actually uh, with patients that are willing to participate in clinical trials in Europe, within Europe. And maybe it's some opportunity for us to reflect on what should be tested in these trials, mm -hmm. what should it really be compared against, so that then the joint approval process has a fairer comparison against what is a European standard, for example. Mm -hmm. So this uh, process of health technology assessment happens towards the end of a, a very long process of uh, drug development, several phases of clinical trials, then the regulatory process, the drug approval. Is that causing significant delays in terms of uh, either a drug or a, a technology making it, uh, you know, becoming available to treat patients? I think the reality at the moment is unfortunately, yes, it does often. But again, you, one can, of course, see this from different sides. One can, you know, equally ask the question, why does it do that? Because there are some treatments that are actually making it surprisingly. People are probably not paying a lot of attention to those, but they make it through the HD process relatively quickly. So if there is a drug that, or an intervention that really brings a massive improvement over something that was not treatable before, it can often be uh, uh, relatively quick to pass the HDA process. But if we're honest, of course, many of the treatments are gradual improvements. And this is where the issue then comes in. How good is the evidence? And often it depends on the HTA process and the European one is just about to start. So okay. we have to still see how that works. But there are other systems, for example, in the UK, where um, the system was governed by a body called NICE that has 20 years of experience. And there is quite a good estimation that the better the evidence is, the faster the HDA process yeah. is actually. Yeah. But linking to that, how does it work when you talk about rare diseases? I mean, we're in an era of precision hematology and in hematology there is an astonishing number of very rare disease. 
do you always have the evidence you need to make this HTA? And I'm not talking about the regulatory approval, yeah. just in terms of HTA, to be able to say that this new drug is at least as good as whatever else was uh, was there before. Yeah, I think this is one of the bigger challenges that everyone is facing at the moment because we all know to generate the evidence alone, it will take a long time mm -hmm. in rare diseases. Um, and I, I think there are examples where at the moment we're seeing an unfortunate development that some of these drugs are not reaching Europe, for example. I think there are lots of joint interests and lots of joint efforts, including by EHA, but also by others to to ultimately make this happen, to ad advocate for this. But um, I think it needs often new solutions. And, and I think at the moment it is probably not satisfactory for all of us. There will have to be solutions thought about like real world evidence collection. What can you compare data against? What is a good enough quality of data? Mm -hmm. A lot of what we're going to be facing f in the future, I think, is discussions about what data do we have? How good is it? Who holds it? How can we actually use it in a comparison, for example, uh, against a new intervention mm -hmm. in rare diseases? Yeah. And that brings to my mind another question. When you think about, um, and we're not talking about rare diseases anymore, but you think about uh, clinical trials, um, we know that sometimes patients that are enrolled in clinical trials are not always completely representative of the population that would most benefit from the drugs. I mean, to me, the example that comes to my mind would be in multiple myeloma, where many patients are very elderly, have renal complications, and clinical trials are often done in younger, slightly younger people. Yep. How valid is the HTA process in that case? We might see in the future, and this is, for example, in countries where this is running already for a longer time, that actually the the payers will only pay then also for the younger patient population. So I think this is something that we should take very, very seriously, that, again, the evidence is really covered, and that is often, of course, not in our power, but I think there is really uh, something that we should consider about us, you know, all of us hematologists being more aware about and advocating for that there are trials that include the elderly, that include the frail patient as well. Mm -hmm. um, because it might otherwise end up that we see restrictions in what is being paid for. It might well be that the public payer says the evidence is only there for people under 65 and then really only under 65 will get access to that treatment. Mm -hmm. There might be a change over time and we need to be all aware about, uh, about that actually. Mm -hmm. So. Um, in this uh, HTA process, from what you tell me, it's very clear that you need a multidisciplinary team. Uh, you know, you mentioned data, so statisticians will be uh, hugely important. And that is already uh, probably a, a difficult process because, as we know, there's different types of statistics and different ways of assessing uh, results. But um, I'm thinking of ethics and the... Um, assessment of the social implication of health technology assessment mm -hmm. does that happen as a as a routine uh, you know is there's always someone there to make sure that um, there is not a bias in terms of the population that will benefit the most from uh, the the drug that's a very interesting point um, I think what is clearly being considered is that patients do play a role in uh, the general scoping of the HTA process as well as physicians. Um, the the involvement of, you know, who these parties would be, you know, would it be eth ethicists, etc., who would really be um, governing the societal impact or, or evaluating that, I think is less clear. In most of these processes, it is mostly about health economists, physicians, and some patient representatives. And I think that is probably one of the reasons why we should all know a little bit more about it, because we can, we should get involved and we can get involved. Mm -hmm. uh, how big that involvement will be will, of course, be in the first round, be governed what, by what is passed now as legislation, mm -hmm. and it might well need improvement over time. Yeah. But, uh, but to be aware of it is probably better and to get involved. Uh, is better than actually just just to complain about it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there will de definitely have to be a learning process. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting question, and I've, I'm wondering whether uh, there might also have to be uh, a wider consciousness amongst uh, physicians, maybe, if there isn't 
if there isn't any other body in the review process that can look at the societal impact, I think a lot of that might have to sit with the physicians that are involved, with the clinicians. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm not saying that they can judge the whole uh, societal impact, but they have a good feeling often what the resources are in the community, in the central hospitals, you know, where are the pressures, where do you have a lack of staff, for example, to administer a very difficult therapy, etc. And, and uh, I don't think that anyone else in the process will be able to make that judgment. Often the health economists, they do their job, but they cannot judge on this. And I think it will be important, you're absolutely right, to establish good links between the, the different disciplines, because you will need a statistician, you will need the health economist, they will play very important roles. But over time, there should be a culture emerging whereby there is a mutual respect between clinicians and these other parties involved in the HTA, mm -hmm. because without that, it could become a very, um, you know, sometimes challenging process. And I have the feeling that the, the ethical question extends to every single part of the process because we live in a system where there's limited resources and choices will have to be made yeah. that will impact an individual's life. Yeah. Uh, and that's always going to be a difficult question. It is a very difficult question. It is a very difficult question. Um, the, uh, the flip side, again, of course, one can see, in some sense, it leads, on the other hand, to a very clear decision. Mm -hmm. So within the system, then, there, sh there is a potential sense at least that following the decision there is an equal treatment within the system that doesn't mean that that is the best uh, treatment that's what we mm -hmm. need to advocate for that's what, what we need to prepare for that we really um, mm -hmm. make clear what the best treatment should be but mm -hmm. um, there are pros and cons yeah. uh, otherwise it could be a complete patchwork mm -hmm. you know one region having better access than another region yeah, yeah. could you face a situation where um, you have a drug that goes through the red regulatory process and is approved, but then goes through an HTA uh, process and uh, doesn't make the cut in terms of health economics. So it would be available potentially to those who can pay for it, but not through uh, insurance system. Yes, and we see that in systems that are already having a HTA process. And this is not, for example, not only the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, they're following this process already for more than a decade. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is a reality in these systems, um, and that is a challenge in itself. Um, um, but it's, it's, it also, I think, is important to exactly realize that. I think for many people still, the decision by the regulator, the EMA or the FDA, has looked as if, and, and I think a lot of the public uh, messaging that goes out there always seems to suggest to us that uh, the regulator's decision already shows that it is better than standard care. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, um, that's really a realization that we all have to make. That's, that's not the case. You know, they have looked at a very specific question only. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to my last question. Um, do you think that HTA should be taught more formally, even in medical school, or be part of the training of a, a specialist? Because it seems to me that it's going to be more and more at the core of care, especially in this era of precision hematology. Yeah, I think, and, and sometimes it might be actually just these fundamentals, mm -hmm. like understanding what the question is that a regulator answers and what the question is that an HTA evaluation answers. I think that should definitely be forming part of the training how much people then want to go into this regulatory uh, field deeper and understand what the health economic models are, etc. That's, of course, probably then going to be sub-specializations. Um, but I think a general understanding would be really, really important. And it should hopefully be an incentive, as uh, many European countries are doing research, to understand, for example, where should trials be done that uh, provide evidence that might not be answered in a regulatory trial. Uh, what could be a trial? Sometimes these are very simple trials. They are, where can you deliver a treatment? Can you give it as a treatment that can be given at home rather than the hospital? These can be questions that can be huge for a public health care system and they can lead sometimes to reimbursement, even if, uh, you know, in the first place it didn't because it used ho uh, hospital resources. So. I think uh, having that training to understand where is the unmet need and to get sensitized for how we use our healthcare resources is actually really going to be use, uh, useful and needed in the future. 
Well, thank you very much, Martin. I think this was a really interesting conversation and uh, uh, I'm sure we're going to see more and more about HTA in the next few years. Likewise. Thank you very much for having me.